And since we've closed the road for you all, we don't have to worry about uh, competing with um, uh, passing traffic. So as you come on to Alexander's Bridge, um, get some place where you can um, can look off of uh, the, uh, the bridge for just a moment uh, and, um, and look at Chickamauga Creek. This modern um, Alexander Bridge, which is um, built within the remains of the um, uh, 1897 abutments built by the Park Commission in the early days of the, of the Battlefield Park, um, this alignment is just a few feet or a few yards um, upstream of um, where the, uh, the wartime uh, bridge was, uh, was located. So the wartime bridge was just a few feet or yards um, just to, um, to, as we face that direction, to our, um, our left. Um, the, uh, the bridge that was here at the time was a wooden structure, one lane wide, uh, and uh, supported by trestles with stone abutments on, uh, limited stone abutments on both ends and closer to the surface of the, uh, the water. Uh, a bridge like this was really required because I would like you to look off at the creek. Remember I mentioned how the limited, there is limited agricultural soil in this region. Um, and that is because of the underlying layers of limestone. This creek is carved down into those layers of limestone. As you look up or downstream, look at the uh, layers of limestone, the edges of those layers that stick out of the, uh, the, uh, the bank at um, different places. Um, this creek is a major military obstacle, then and even today, because of those steep banks. And when Bragg went to develop his plan, one of the things that he had to identify was places to cross Chickamauga Creek, and he will identify those. Dalton or Hunts Ford, Bedford's Ford, Alexander's Bridge, potentially Byram's or Lambert's Ford, Reed's Bridge, and as high up as Dyer's Bridge or Dyer's Ford. Um, the um, uh, Chickamauga Creek can only be crossed by organized bodies of troops and in particular wheeled vehicles at um, these existing or prepared um, crossing sites like bridges or fords. Not every potential crossing of this creek had a bridge on it. Um, and in, within the area where Bragg wants to move, there are only um, Alexander's Bridge, Reed's Bridge, and Dyer's Bridge uh, that he can aim at. Um, the, it is not so much the width of the creek or even the depth of the water in the creek. Because of the continuing year-long drought, that had begun in the summer of 1862 and continued into 1863, the water level in the creek was lower than normal, uh, and, but still the creek was um, not easily crossed um, at just any place where you might encounter it. Now an individual soldier could get down the bank of the creek, get into the water, get wet, get on the other side and get out. But if you got a lot of troops you've got to cross, you're not going to get them to cross in that fashion. You've got to have the bridges and fords. And so when Rosecrans, battle tracking on his map, said, if I were my enemy, I'd try to swing across the creek and get between me and Chattanooga, guess where Rosecrans started to stick most of the troops who became available? At the crossings of Chickamauga Creek. Minty's Brigade covering the crossing at Reed's Bridge, Wilder covering now the crossing here at Alexander's Bridge. When Wilder came into this area and did his terrain rec uh, reconnaissance and decided how he was going to dispose his troops on the, uh, the terrain, um, he did indeed consider Chickamauga Creek. It is an obstacle for him, a barrier between him and his enemy. The bridge channelizes the enemy's approach. What did Wilder do to the wooden bridge that was here at the time? Burned it? Um, well, um, most of my military groups, the immediate answer is blew it. Uh, they, like, they like blowing stuff up. But 
Um, you never want to destroy a bridge because you might want to use it. Yeah. Um, they'll, they will take the planks off. Um, now, exactly when they take the planks off is something that is not entirely clear because it's something I'll cover in, um, in just a few minutes. But they eventually will take the planks off of the bridge and pile them up on this side. Um, and the men of Company A, the 72nd Indiana, will take shelter behind the pile of planks. Um, and so now, those 30 some odd guys are behind the planks, their horses and mules are tied around the trees uh, via the sinkhole. There are other soldiers spread out along the bank of the creek, and the scouts are out on the other side. Now this is the first time that Union troops have really been in this area, and hence, the farms have not yet been picked over. It's late summer! What's in all of the gardens? Harvest. Yeah, food! And some of these Union soldiers cannot resist the temptation to supplement their boiled beef and hardtack um, with, uh, with something else. And there's reconnoiter uh, foraging going on out there to the, uh, to the other side of the creek, um, including one farm that has a vineyard. No recorded record that they found any of the products of that vineyard, but um, the, uh, so there is foraging going on. Uh, Wilder will take um, position here that evening of the, or afternoon of the 17th. We'll spend the night here, and the next morning, his scouts will go out again. And this time, they don't get very far out to the southeast um, and east before they encounter Confederate forces coming this way because now Bragg is moving to execute his plan. And the column of Confederates under William Henry Talbert shot Pouch Walker styled the Reserve Corps of the Army of the Cumberland, or excuse me, Army of Tennessee, but that Reserve Corps is being used as part of the offensive punch of Bragg's army on September the 18th. They had marched up from Lafayette the evening before, camp in the area of Peavine Church, and now, on the morning of the 18th, start their march towards Alexander's Bridge. Except, Bragg's staff planning has been very poor. He, uh, Buckner's column, uh, excuse me, Walker's column, has been put on the same road for about two miles that Buckner's column is expected to march on. And there is a traffic jam. Um, between a core of about 8,000 and a core of about 10,000. What did that do to Bragg's timetable of a rapid movement that morning to get to the designated crossing sites? It will delay it. The front of this movement is covered by only a small part of Nathan Bedford Forest Calvary. Um, but at that Calvary, men of uh, Pegram's division, and in particular Pegram's um, own brigade, uh, they are, um, are ranging in front, and they are what uh, Wilder scouts encounter that morning. Um, and as soon as those scouts encounter those approaching Confederates, word is sent back to Wilder, um, and Wilder will then do the most important thing he does all day. He reports the approach of the enemy. He sends a courier back to Tom Crittenden and William Stark Rosecrans that says Confederate forces are pushing this way. Soon, there is more evidence of the size and scale of this Confederate movement. So it is a renewal of the evidence of the evening before. So dry has it been? that the road, dirt road surfaces have been ground into a fine powdery dust, and any time a sizable body of troops moved, that ankle or shoe mouth deep dust on the road was driven into the air. And all of a sudden, what do the observers in the treetops up there at the Alexander Farmstead see beginning to rise off to the south and southeast? Columns of dust. And those columns of dust began to get closer to this point and also nearby points. That is reported as well. Uh, this, the, uh, the columns of dust had even been seen by uh, federal observers on the evening of the 17th when Bragg pre-staged troops by moving them up from Lafayette. 
Bragg did not follow um, security by, say, making that move after dark when the dust would not have been uh, evident um, at, uh, at all. But now the Confederates are advancing. It is not, however, until noon that the, um, the head of um, William Henry Talbert Shot Pouch Walker's column begins to approach right here um, at Alexander's Bridge. In the meantime, Wilder will hear from Robert H.G. Minty covering the crossing up at Reed's Bridge. Minty, as it turns out, um, is outnumbered seven to one. Now, Minty knew he was outnumbered, probably felt he was outnumbered about 700 to one, um, but um, uh, Minty recognizes that he does not have sufficient forces to guard Reed's Bridge and nearby crossings, and as he deals with Forrest and Bushrod Johnson's column, he requests assistance. The nearest assistance for Minty is Wilder. And a messenger comes from Minty saying, can you spare any force to cover another crossing of Chickamauga Creek? And Wilder, in, um, in that morning of the um, 18th, before Walker's column has fully manifested itself here, felt confident enough that he gave um, Minty two of his four available regiments and two of the three-inch ordnance rifles of Eli Lilly's um, uh, battery. Now this is where the issue of exactly when did they take the planks up come in. Because when the 123rd Illinois and 72nd Indiana, minus Company A, which stays right here, when they leave Wilder to go support Minty, they cross the creek from this side to this side, turned and went north, and joined Minty while he was still east of Chickamauga Creek. Now, it is possible that they might have crossed up at Byrams or Lambert's Ford, but as, as difficult as that ford is, you might think that somebody in the Lilly section would have said something about, we got sent to Minty, and boy, didn't we have a hard time getting across the creek. So they might not have taken the planks up until the very um, last minute. Uh, but those two regiments depart here, cross the creek to the east, then turn north and go up to Minty. So what's Wilder got left here now? He's got two regiments of mounted infantry, fighting dismounted, and four three-inch ordnance rifles. The main body is up on the top of the, um, of the hill, and he's got the troops along the, uh, the bank. The uh, head of Walker's column arrives um, right about noon, and Walker looks across what was then a, um, a larger open area, but also a, a wooded area with a couple of rises in the distance, and he sees that his potential crossing of Chickamauga Creek is guarded by a federal force. At 2 o'clock, he spreads Edward Carey Walthall's brigade of Mississippians out and sends them forward to try to seize Alexander's Bridge. Now when Walthall's men were deployed, all five regiments of the brigade were put on line, um, off to the southeast, um, just a, 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 about a thousand yards or so, um, and at, um, uh, at, with their left anchored on the road from Alexander's Bridge. What Walthall could not see was that the road right at the bridge made a turn or bend similar to what you see right here um, even today. Um, when Wal when Wal uh, and also Walthall is not aware of how the creek runs as well. And he's essentially going to be advancing into kind of the point of a V. Um, the four regiments, or excuse me, the five regiments begin their advance at two o'clock. And as soon as they do, Lily's batter gunners up on the top of the hill see that Confederate advance begin. And they open fire, firing what um, uh, Henry Campbell, the bugler of the 18th Indiana Battery, describes as long range canister. 
K-shot rounds with the fuse cut um, just a little bit short for the range that they are being fired so that the fuse will burn and cause the projectile to explode just a little bit um, short and in front of and above the expected target, compensating for um, the, um, uh, the variability of the fuses and wanting to make sure that the projectile explodes so that maybe it's only the forward momentum of the projectile that carries the fragments down onto the target. But those two guns will open fire. And so as the Mississippians advance um, gets closer, Lily orders the remaining two guns of the battery to, um, to come up and take position as well. And now four guns have opened fire on the, um, uh, the advancing Mississippians. The Mississippians get closer, um, and um, as they do, the men who are deployed along the brush at the edge of the creek and the man of Company A, 72nd Indiana, will open fire. Um, and one of you all has my firepower. <laughs> Of course, the men of Wilder's Brigade are armed with the seven-shot Spencer repeating rifle, the most advanced weapon then available um, in any um, numbers to the armies of the, of the time. Wilder had gotten permission to mount his brigade in the spring of 1863 and then wanted to replace the standard muzzle-loading rifle muskets that his men carried with something more advanced wanted the Henry rifles, but the Henry Company could not provide enough. And so there is the famous story that Wilder, a businessman from Indiana, then went to his business associates and banker friends and made arrangements to borrow the money to buy the Spencer repeating rifles from the company and that his men agreed to um, pay, uh, pay them back or to make the purchase out of their, uh, their pay. Wilder certainly was preparing to do that, but there's a real problem with that. In the spring of 1863, the Spencer Repeating Rifle Company was more than one year behind schedule in delivering the first 10,000 Spencer Repeating Rifles that the Army had ordered. How can the company sell any to somebody else before they deliver the 10,000 that are a year behind schedule but based on the Army contract. Now, in May of 1863, the Spencer Repeating Rifle Company began to deliver the first of the 10,000 of the Army contract Spencers. And Rosecrans gets about 2,000 of them. And about 1,600 of them come to Wilder's Brigade. So in the end, the Spencers that Wilder's men were armed with in late May and early June of 1863 are government-owned Spencers. Wilder's men did not buy them out of their own pocket. Now one reason why that story of Wilder's men buying them out of their own pocket persists is at the end of the war, the, Ar the United States Army has about a million men in the fields with arms. Some of those soldiers have been carrying Model 1861 Springfield rifle muskets for four years. What kind of condition is a 1861, Model 1861 Springfield rifle musket by the spring of 1865? Pretty bad. And the Army decided they don't necessarily want to keep all those weapons. And they actually went through the force in May, June, July of 1865 and evaluated all the weapons in the hands of the troops. And they classed them in four categories. The weapons in class one and two would be retained by the United States Army. They were serviceable weapons in good condition. The weapons in classes three and four would be offered to the troops themselves for a small fee to take home. Now, in, the, in June of 1865, you're in Ohio, in an early war Ohio regiment, um, and you've still got the same Model 1861 Springfield rifle muskets that you started out with in um, 1861. And the thing is that that is valued at 50 cents. Are you gonna pay 50 cents and take it home? Probably not. But you're one of Wilder's men 
who got a Spencer repeating rifle in May or June of 1865 or 1863. You've now carried it for two years. It's ridden across your saddle for two years, banging away, and almost all of these in this um, uh, situation, this area of the stock right here is worn and broken away. The stock is otherwise nicked and the, uh, the like, and your Spencer is classed three or four. And for $3.50, you can take it home. Guess what? Lots and lots of Wilder's men who had a class four or three Spencer did in, when their units were mustered out in the summer of 1865. They paid the $3.50 and took the Spencer home. So when research really began on Wilder's Brigade in the 1970s and 80s, guess where lots of Spencers were coming from? Out of family hands, which only made it seem like what? They purchased them when? In May and June of 1863. But in actuality, when had they purchased them? In 1865. So it's a persistent story. Um, even some newer histories um, written by better people still carry that, um, that old story. But now as these Mississippians are advancing, this weapon is going to uh, begin to again prove its real value. The men along the creek bank and the men of Company A, 72nd Indiana, open fire. Half cocking the weapon, uh, working the action, the chamber around. Well, I guess we're not going to be firing this one anymore. The chamber around. These reproductions are not very well manufactured. So um, some of you all might have seen the demonstrations um, over the weekend. Probably saw illustration of that as well. Then half cocked the weapon and pulled the trigger. To fire again, half cock, work the action, full cock, pull the trigger. How much more quickly can they fire? The 30-some guys here. And a couple hundred guys along the other bank open fire. As the Mississippians get closer, Lily intensifies his fire. As the Mississippians get closer and begin to fire back themselves, the 98th um, uh, Illinois has moved out onto the slope and begins to put some volleys of Spencer repeating rifle fire over the heads of the men along the bank of the creek and into the Mississippians in the front and more or to their front. And more Mississippians begin to drop as casualties. And then the Mississippians begin to run into problems. Remember I said they were advancing kind of into an angle or bend, <coughs> narrowing? As they do, the left of the brigade has to cross the road. Well, as they cross the road, guess what that gives the 30-some men of Company A um, with their Spencer? A perfect lane of fire and they drop large numbers of the 24th, 27th, and 29th Mississippian uh, soldiers as they cross the road. Um, and then the right flank of the brigade suddenly came up against the bank of the creek and can't advance any further. And about the same time, lots of those Mississippians also saw something else. What's on the stringers of the bridge? Nothing. And under that increasing volume of fire, there weren't any of those Mississippians who wanted to do a tightrope back across the stringers of the bridge. And the Mississippians halt and find cover behind irregularities in the terrain on the other side of the creek. It's about 2.15. 105 of the Mississippians have become casualties in just 15 minutes time. The brigade numbered almost 1,800, and in, in 15 minutes time, 105 of them have gone down under the artillery and Spencer repeating rifle fire. Okay, William Henry Talbert shot pouch walker. The brigade that you've just sent to seize Alexander's Bridge has been halted. What do you do? You've got three other brigades. How effective is sending a second or third brigade forward going to be? Govan's um, Arkansas Brigade has closed up on Walthall's left a little bit, but under the growing fire, it's not um, likely to make any progress. Walker had been told 
to cross either here at um, Alexander's Bridge or at, Re, um, at Byram's or Lambert's Ford. And he decides to divert to the downstream crossing about a mile. But to do that is going to cost him what? Time. Time. And he will begin to move down that way. But it is now well after 2 o'clock. Bragg's plan is more than a half day behind schedule. The poor route planning and then the resistance here by Wilder. And even more critically than that, what does William Stark Rosecrans at Crawfish Springs now start to see more clearly? Exactly what he had anticipated Bragg might try to do, Bragg is indeed doing. Um, and Rosecrans is going to start to react. Um, uh, the, um, uh, and uh, as Walker moves down to, uh, to begin to cross at Myers and Lambert's Ford, uh, crossing that um, Wilder did have under observation, but did not have a significant number of troops at. Um, word also comes to Wilder that Minty has been forced back across the creek at Reed's Bridge and that Wilder's essential left and left rear has been turned or will be threatened. And Wilder um, is going to, uh, to issue the orders to withdraw. Um, and uh, he will begin to pull out of, um, of this position. But we'll talk about that more as we go back up on the hill in just a moment. Questions or observations um, right here? What was the weather like at that time? Um, the, uh, the days are still um, um, warm, um, not as warm as today, uh, probably, although you do get some soldiers who, um, who talk about it being hot. But remember, they're moving, they're being shot at. Um, so that's probably going to exaggerate it a little bit. Right. The temperature seems to be in the 70s. Um, yeah, comfortable uh, during the daytime. The, but the nights have been cold enough to frost. The night of the, um, um, the, the um, well, the, not so much the night of the 17th, 18th, but the, definitely the night of the 18th, 19th, and the 19th and 20th are going to be cold enough to frost. Yes. Uh, question. I'm a grandson of, uh, uh, of a uh, uh, soldier from the 27th Mississippi. Uh, wh about where would they be over here if I went over that in that direction? Well, you that's, know, that's, or is it just mixed? Well, um, one of the things that is very difficult to reconcile um, are the seemingly detailed and accurate descriptions of the lay of the road um, by the man in the 24th, 27th, 29th Mississippi um, and anything that is over there today. Um, there, um, this wet weather drainage that comes right in here complicates all of this. The wartime road seems to have run down that wet weather drainage further to the southeast and then turned off um, in that direction. But you mentioned so, that they had come across, right? so they're, they could be in any of these woods right here. Right, they're, they're coming from over here this way. They're coming at an angle to the creek and the bridge. Um, and they're crossing the road as it made that bend or angle, uh, which apparently was down in this wet weather uh, drainage and over a little bit more. Um, this has, has been a, a point of inquiry and, and um, debate uh, for certainly the 30 years I've been around here. Um, and um, the, the one seemingly most detailed map that we have of that area just doesn't really match up with what the soldiers say. So, um, so I think it's, um, uh, it's something that, well, one of the things I know that I need to do, and that is, is to get, um, um, uh, really get down and start measuring exactly how big the frontage of each one of those regiments would have been and kind of put that on the ground. The creek has not really moved and then start playing with some other options with where the road would be. So, so when they deployed the 7 across, the 27th would have been on this side they're on the, this way? They're on the, they're the second regiment from the right. left of the brigade. Okay. So. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the second regiment from the right of the brigade. Yes. I have a question. Uh, um, I'll get you in just a second, ma'am. So. How many shots from, that a soldier could fire per minute from a muzzle loader versus the Spencer repeating rifle? A uh, man with the Spencer could fire three to four times as fast as a soldier with the Spencer repeating rifles. 
Thank you. I had a, a lovely visit to Leon Gordon's Mill on Sunday, and I saw the uh, the creek runs in which direction from under us? <laughs> yeah, it uh, flow upstream is that direction, and downstream is this direction. And was there an influence as to the the moonlight? Um, because the, um, I, I know that we are getting the moon exactly right. as it was. Well, it's it's uh, the moon was about uh, forty percent um, uh, illuminated. Um, or exposed um, on the nights of the, of the battle and will rise um, after dark um, and so you do get some moonlight unless you're in the woods and you're in the s remaining smoke from the battle and the forest fire. So, yes. um, one more and then we'll I'll take some more as we go up the hill. Yes sir. I think you said it was the 98th Illinois yeah, that was firing over the heads yeah. of the troops. Yeah. At the and the 17th and Indiana does some of that too. The, okay. the 98th actually moves out in the open just a little bit to better deliver their fire. Well, that's what I wanted to ask. How far up the slope are they? They're they're pretty from they're pretty far up the slope. I, they're up at near the very top. So. Okay, thank you. Well, one last question. Uh, <laughs> what was the foliage like in, in this area in terms of the view of fire, field of fire? Well, there were just a few scattered trees along the uh, the bank of the uh, the creek, and then there was the big cornfield on the on that side, and the big uncultivated field on the other. Side. So, um, I'll see if I can take a few more questions as I walk backwards up the uh, the hill. Um, so. <laughs> of um, a tower. Um, well, he, he actually does not have the Spencer okay, so being right. Even though he gets people from Wilder. Right. It, well, he sends them to another crossing okay. to guard, um, and he is outgunned with his men are only armed with the standard breech-loading single-shot um, cavalry carbines. Um, and they don't have the range. Uh, they are actually uh, the, the advancing Confederate infantry with the rifle musket um, actually outmatches the um, the, the cavalry. And you say he's forced back across the bridge, but he was actually trying to hold on. Right. He started out on the east side because there isn't as good defensive terrain at Reed's Bridge. So, now you were asking about ammunition. Yeah, I wanted to know uh, did it require special ammunition? Yes, other it did. Loads. It was a it was a copper cartridge and, case, and they projector. had to get that out into the field at the right place at the right time. Yep. Well, Wilder had anticipated those problems. If you give a soldier a weapon that shoots three to four times as fast, what do you better figure that the soldier's going to do? Shoot three to four times as fast, <laughs> which means you've got to supply three to four times as much ammunition. So Wilder ordered all of his men to carry 200 additional rounds of ammunition in the nose bag of their animals. So when they hopped off of their animal, they had their Spencer in one hand and their cartridge box over their shoulder and the nose bag of their animals in the other hand. They probably looked like really militant farmers <laughs> going out to feed. So. That was a Ford Tiffany from a bridge. Um, a ford is just a pla natural place where the bank slopes down um, to allow easy access into the water. But the material of the bank has to be solid enough to support the weight of whatever is going to cross. Um, and the bottom has to be solid enough to do the same thing as well. Okay. Now, the Confederates didn't have the capability to produce. No. So well, capturing weapons wouldn't have done much good unless they captured the ammunition. ammunition. Right. That's right. That's unlike other weapons. Right. The, the car, the, what made the Spencer finally possible was the invention of the cartridge case just shortly before the Civil War. Yes? Was Walker under the impression that Forrest or other cavalry had already occupied the bridge? He makes a comment in the report that I didn't know I had to fight for right. until I got here. Yeah, the, in earlier versions of Bragg's order, um, Bragg had said that um, these crossings will be seized um, and Alexander's Bridge had been named as one of them. Um, but as part of the lack of synchronization in Bragg's plan, that had not occurred. And in fact, the question you can ask is how would that have occurred given Forrest had been spread out as he was?
Brooks send any engineers along with the infantry? No, oh. only a um, small handful of um, sappers, um, pioneers, mm -hmm. uh, but they don't have, they've only got some axes and shovels, so they don't have much capability. So. Okay. Actually, um, I'll credit the, um, he's around here somewhere. I got this idea from uh, from Mr. Mertz. So, uh, mm -hmm. Watching him, watching him handle um, groups uh, at uh, at Fredericksburg last December and Chancellorsville yeah. in May. So. Hey, pause here for uh, for just a moment. Anybody remember what we are opposite? Sinkhole. The sinkhole. What's tied around the trees at the sinkhole? Horses. Horses. The horses and mules. A company A, 72nd in the end. When Wilder issues the order to withdraw. Who's going to have the toughest time getting out of here? Yes. Company A, 72nd Indiana. Where are they? Behind the rail pile down there at the bridge. The Mississippians are shooting at them. What's between them and their friends on the top of the hill? Lots of open um, uh, ground. Well, apparently, somebody up here on the top of the hill figured that they weren't going to get out of here. And if they're going to be essentially abandoned or sacrificed, do you want the enemy to get their animals? No. Now, Company A, 72nd Indiana, learned that Wilder was withdrawing, was all of a sudden there was some firing that attracted their attention at the sinkhole, where there all of a sudden is a bunch of dust, where fire from their comrades on the top of the hill as killing their animals. The sergeant in charge realizes that we've got to get out of here, and he orders the men to begin to withdraw in ones and twos. And they begin to pull back across the field, many of them going back by the, uh, the now dead or badly injured animals at the sinkhole, trying to get a few personal items off of their animal, um, but they begin to scatter. The last man of the company out of the, uh, the position um, are a couple of soldiers, including young George Bailey, who had just turned 18. Uh, he's having a really good day shooting his Spencer rifle and dropping one Mississippian after another in front of him down the corridor of the road. One of the sergeants has to literally grab him by the back of the collar and drag him from behind the rail pile to starting back up the hill. Amazingly, all the men of the company get out of there. A couple of slight wounds, none of them are killed, none of them are captured. The company will not fight as an organized body the rest of the battle, but within a couple of days they will be reorganized again um, and uh, as part of the, um, uh, of the uh, the regiment. So, uh, but it's a, a little um, uh, fa uh, illustration of just how yeah, intense even that part of this little engagement was um, that somebody thought that they weren't going to be able to get out of it. So we'll go up and have, make one more brief pause to conclude the first of our walks. About time. When they say we did this at 1.30, we did this at 4 o'clock. Does that correspond to no, what we they, No, they are, they are working on sun time. But the other problem is that we don't know necessarily, if they do have a timepiece, how they are setting their timepiece off of sun time. Um, there is no standard time yet. Um, the, uh, that will not come about until the 1880s. Um, it, is, um, it is clear that uh, most people are indeed trying to judge um, noon by when the sun is directly overhead, um, but there's also good evidence that some people are using um, the almanacs, published separate almanacs, and the um, astronomical schedules that appear in the newspapers. Uh, but if you're doing that off of a, um, a Louisville, Kentucky newspaper, the fact that that is further to the west is going to have an influence on how you interpret time here. Um, just as today, if you want to go back and calculate sun time, um, you've got to take standard time out 
um, and um, and then um, standard time is judged on essentially the middle of our time zones. So you got to factor in that difference um, as well. So um, it, it gets pretty complex. Um, uh, and then uh, the biggest thing is just how was if somebody had a watch, how were they setting that watch? But very few people have watches. Um, in fact, the chief engineer of the Army of the Cumberland, um, when um, James um, St. Clair Morton, when he is um, uh, 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 investigated in one of the courts of inquiry as a result of this disaster here at Chickamauga, is said, well, what time was that? And his answer was, I don't know. I don't carry a watch. <laughs> He's the chief engineer of the Army of the Cumberland, and he doesn't carry a watch. Um, that was not his only problem as chief engineer of the Army of the Cumberland. But, uh, uh, arrogance was his other one. <laughs> Uh, but I pause here to, uh, to just conclude this, um, this walk. When Wilder realizes that upstream or to the north of him, or excuse me, downstream or to the north of him, that Minty is having to abandon Reed's Bridge, uh, Wilder has to order withdrawal. But unlike Minty, who rode to the rear, Wilder did not simply ride off into the sunset to the west. He, with the two regiments that he had and the four um, guns of Eli Lilly's battery, will fall back down this corridor of the road that he had come in on and in front of the advancing Confederates of Bushrod Johnson who have crossed up at Reed's Bridge. And he will slow their advance westward that late afternoon of September the 18th. And so he has bought intelligence for William Stark Rosecrans of sizable Confederate approach and movement. He has delayed that Confederate column and he has bought time for William Stark Rosecrans to begin to respond. And even though he's been forced to abandon the position that he'd been tasked to guard, he continues the uh, mission by continuing contact with the enemy, falling back to the next defensible position. And as you and the, uh, those of you who are going to join us for the next program, as you go over the next few minutes west on Alexander Vineyard Road, you will come to um, an area where there are a number of cast iron uh, tablets, both Union and Confederate, a couple of markers. There is a gravel parking area and a gate that leads down to Dalton and Thedford's Ford where we'll go on the next program. But it is in that area where Wilder will first stop and put up resistance to this approaching Confederate column. They will have to fall back from that position just a little bit, but um, he does not go all the way back to the Lafayette Road or the Union left flank. Um, so Wilder has done an excellent job here, and I think more than anything, or more than even the Spencer um, repeating rifles, what gave Wilder the advantage was um, his um, use of the terrain and integrating his combined arms weapons team into this terrain. Um, and we'll see this again with Wilder later in this battle as well. Well, our time for this first program has um, expired in 15 seconds. So um, <laughs> if you have a really short question, I'll be able to answer that. But no, I'll be here for a couple minutes um, to answer a few questions. And then I myself will have to make it to, um, to our next start point so we can be ready to go again at, um, at 6.30. Yeah, 4 down, do we go to the